you love here on VOA1 The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program... I report on the Ukraine war's effects on carbon emissions. Faith Perlow reviews some writing by one of our listeners, and we listen to the next part in our American History series, The Making of a Nation. But first... The war in Ukraine is worsening the climate crisis, a new report says. A group of researchers will present the report this week at the United Nations Climate Meeting in Bonn, Switzerland. The scientists report that the first 12 months of the war will lead to increased production of waste gases that heat the planet. They expect the increase will amount to about 120 million metric tons of gas emissions, or release. That is equal to a year's worth of emissions by the country of Belgium. Dutch expert Leonard de Klerk is the lead writer of the report, Climate Damage Caused by Russia's War in Ukraine. He led a team of researchers investigating the creation of war-linked emissions. The causes include fuel use for vehicles, forest fires, changes in energy use in Europe, and the future rebuilding of buildings and roads. We didn't expect the emissions of war would be so significant, said de Klerk by phone from his home in Hungary near the border with Ukraine. Carbon accounting will be an important subject of discussion at the COP28 climate meeting in Dubai this year. Countries will measure progress against climate goals agreed to in Paris in 2015. De Klerk said it was very important that military emissions were included. The aim that we all should have is to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, including the military. But if you don't know what the military emissions are, It's very difficult to start work on policies to reduce them, de Klerk said. The European Climate Foundation and the Environmental Policy and Advocacy Initiative in Ukraine paid for the research and report. Almost half of the estimated increase in emissions since the Ukraine war started in February 2022 is connected to the expected rebuilding and repairing needs. The fighting has destroyed or damaged many roads, factories, and other structures and systems. About 19% of the emissions come from military activities like vehicle fuel use, making and firing weapons, and building defensive structures. The total also includes planet-warming gas production linked to the conflict but happening outside Ukraine. That includes gas leaks from the destroyed Nord Stream pipeline, the redirects of international flights, and the movement of refugees. The report said there had been a drop in Ukraine's own economic activity due to the conflict but it said emissions related to those activities had mainly moved to other countries. The report also said there was a drop in emissions in Europe linked to lower flows of Russian gas and a drop in electricity usage from higher energy costs. But that decrease had almost all been offset by increases in the use of oil, coal, and liquefied natural gas. 
carbon accounting expert de Klerk said government reports on military-linked emissions are often unclear and inexact. Emissions created by armies in foreign territory are not counted, and annexed territories are sometimes double-counted, he said. Other studies have attempted to measure emissions from conflicts. A project called Costs of War at Brown University in Rhode Island measured emissions from American military activities outside the U.S. between 2001 and 2018. The researchers reported that the U.S. military's activities in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria created 440 million metric tons of emissions. A few weeks ago, we asked our readers and listeners to write about having guests over. Many of you wrote in, using the words you learned. One reader, Gerardo, wrote to us about his cousin Peter's visit. In this week's Everyday Grammar, we will comment on Gerardo's message. And we will give some grammar suggestions. I usually am very fond of guests. Two weeks ago, I suddenly met my cousin Peter near the bus station. We have not seen each other for ages. He came to the Sitta for just three weeks, so I invited him over for drinks last weekend. He was short of time, but he finally accepted. On Saturday, we spent time catching up, talking about those beautiful days we played games and eating in the countryside when we were very young. We had dinner together, and then he left. Let's start with the first two sentences. I usually am very fond of guests. Two weeks ago, I suddenly met my cousin Peter near the bus station. Gerardo uses the adverb usually, which means generally or under normal conditions. While this is a good adverb to use, we suggest placing the adverb after the auxiliary or helping verb be. I am usually very fond of guests. The adjective fond is a great descriptive word. It is stronger than like, but a little less strong than love. Lastly, in these two sentences, we have suddenly met. The adverb and verb combination are a good way to describe the chance meeting. In American English, we have a phrasal verb that is widely used in everyday speech for that chance meeting. Run into. Run into means to meet someone by chance or without planning. I am usually very fond of guests. Two weeks ago, I ran into my cousin Peter near the bus station. Let's move on to the next three sentences. We have not seen each other for ages. He came to the Sitta for just three weeks, so I invited him over for drinks last weekend. There are only a few small changes we need in these three sentences. Since Gerardo is writing in the past tense throughout the paragraph, we suggest keeping the past tense in the third sentence by using the past perfect. The past perfect is helping verb had plus the past participle of the verb. 
We had not seen each other for ages. In the fourth sentence, there is a small spelling error. We can change "sita" to "city." He came to the city for just three weeks. In the fifth sentence, we will add a comma after the word "so." So, in this case, is an introductory word or transition. We add a comma after introductory words of this kind to show that the main part of the sentence follows. And lastly, in that sentence, we can remove the hyphen between the words "week" and "end." And combine them as a one-word compound noun. So I invited him over for drinks last weekend. Added comma. Let's look at the sixth sentence. He was short of time, but he finally accepted. We suggest changing two things in this sentence. First, we suggest changing the preposition of. To on, while both short of and short on can mean similar things, short on means there is less time than expected or wanted, while short of means a lacking of something. Plus, short on time is used more often in American English than short of time. Our final observation is that we need to add a comma between time and the conjunction but. These are two separate sentences combined with but, so we need a comma. He was short on time, but he finally accepted. Added comma. We will continue with the final part of Gerardo's paragraph. And suggest some organizational tips later. Today we looked at Gerardo's message about his cousin's visit. We thought about adverb placement, commas, and verbal tense. We learned a new phrasal verb, run into. We even looked at the small differences between short of time. And short on time. We will continue with Gerardo's message in a few weeks. Thank you, Gerardo, for sending your writing to us. I'm Faith Perlo. I'm Brian Lynn. And I'm Dorothy Gundy. That was Faith Perlo with this week's Everyday Grammar. Welcome back to the show, Faith. Thanks, Dan. This week you reviewed Gerardo's message about a visit from his cousin Peter. I reviewed some of the grammar throughout Gerardo's message. You mentioned the adjective fond, and you said that it is stronger than liking something, but a little less strong than loving something. So, what exactly does it mean? That's a great question. There are two uses of fond, like in Gerardo's message, we can say that we are fond of something, or fond of someone. That means that we like that thing or person very much. So that's why I said it is stronger than like, but a little less strong than love. For example, I love cats. But I am fond of dogs. What are you fond of, Dan? I guess I would say I love playing baseball, but I'm fond of basketball as well. What is the second use? The second use is as an adjective that you would use before a noun. It is similar to a feeling of happiness and love. It is kind of like that feeling that we say is warm and fuzzy. It makes you feel really happy or good. We often use it with the word memory. So I have fond childhood memories of baking cookies with my family. Do you have any fond memories, Dan? 
yeah, I have a lot of fond memories. And since Father's Day is coming up, and I just mentioned baseball, I have fond memories of playing baseball with my dad. In the evenings, we'd often walk over to the nearby school and play there. That sounds like an awesome memory. Thanks for having me on the show. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We look back at the presidential election of 1976. When Vice President Gerald Ford became president in 1974, he took office during a crisis. For the first time in American history, a president, Richard Nixon, had resigned. Nixon resigned as a result of the case known as Watergate. It involved the cover-up of illegal activities related to his re-election campaign. Lies about Watergate only added to the mistrust of Americans angry at having been misled about the war in Vietnam. After Vietnam and Watergate, many people no longer believed their public officials. Voters rejected Gerald Ford, a Republican, in the presidential election of 1976. Instead, they chose Jimmy Carter, the candidate of the Democrats. Why? One reason was that Ford had pardoned Nixon. He declared a pardon for any crimes that Nixon might have committed. This made many people angry. Also, he refused requests for federal aid for New York and other cities. Voters may have felt that he was not concerned about the problems of poor people. Others believe that unemployment and inflation defeated Gerald Ford. He was not able to deal effectively with these problems during his short presidency. There was competition for the Republican Party nomination in 1976. Ford's chief opponent was Ronald Reagan, who had just served two terms as governor of California. Democrats thought that voter anger about Watergate would help their party win the White House. Eleven Democrats campaigned for the nomination. Two well-known politicians did not campaign, but they said they would serve if no other candidate won the party's support. They were former Vice President Hubert Humphrey and Senator Ted Kennedy. One of the lesser-known candidates was the former governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter. My name is Jimmy Carter, and I'm running for president. Political experts gave him little chance of winning the nomination. Most Democrats did not even know who he was. Before becoming governor... He had been a nuclear power engineer in the Navy and a peanut farmer in Georgia. Again and again, he told people that he was not part of the political establishment in Washington. He also had strong Christian beliefs. This appealed to a lot of voters. Many voters supported Carter in the primary elections leading up to the party's nominating convention. His victory in the Florida primary was especially important. He defeated another politician from the South, Governor George Wallace of Alabama. Jimmy Carter represented what was called the New South. He made it clear that he opposed the ideas of the Old South, like discrimination against blacks. George Wallace spoke of creating a better life for both blacks and whites. 
Yet, he had strongly defended racial separation for most of his political life. Many people remembered pictures of Governor Wallace at the University of Alabama in 1963. The pictures showed him blocking the door to prevent two young blacks from attending the school. The Republican primaries had mixed results for President Ford. Right now I predict that the American people are going to say that night, Jerry, you've done a good job. Keep right on doing it. For example, in New Hampshire, he won only 51% of the vote. Ronald Reagan won 49%. But in Massachusetts, Ford won twice as many votes as Reagan did. The campaign showed that Reagan was more conservative than Ford. For example, Reagan talked strongly about United States control of the Panama Canal. In his words, we built it, we paid for it, it's ours, and we are going to keep it. President Carter would later decide differently. Ford, in his campaign speeches, denounced extremism. It was clear that he was talking about his opponent, Ronald Reagan. Ford and Reagan won almost the same amount of support in the Republican primaries. Yet, many delegates at the nominating convention remained undecided. This was a dangerous situation for the Republican Party. Party leaders did not want a fight over undecided votes at the convention. They worried that a lack of unity could damage the party's chances in the general election. The situation was similar for the Democrats. Support for Jimmy Carter increased. But some Democrats who did not like him began to say, anybody but Carter. Carter's campaign message was that he did not have ties to special interest groups, that he would be different. I see an America that has turned away from scandals and corruption. I see an American president who governs with vigor and with vision and affirmative leadership. A president who is not isolated from our people, but a president who feels your pain and who shares your dreams. I see an America on the move again, united, its wounds healed, an America entering its third century with confidence and competence and compassion, an America that lives up to the majesty of its constitution and the simple decency of its people. This is my vision of America. I hope you share it, and I hope you will help me fight for it. Many people liked what they heard. Carter won the Democratic primaries in Georgia, Alabama, and Indiana. The other candidates fell hopelessly behind. At the party convention, he was nominated on the first vote. In his acceptance speech, he repeated the line that he continually used with voters. My name is Jimmy Carter, and I'm running for president. Carter said there was a fear that America's best years were over. He said the nation's best was still to come. 1976 will not be a year of politics as usual. It can be a year of inspiration and hope. And it will be a year of concern, of quiet and sober reassessment of our nation's character and purpose. A year when voters have already confounded the experts. And I guarantee you that it will be the year when we give the government of this country back to the people of this country. Walter Mondale, a senator from Minnesota, became the party's vice presidential candidate.
A month before the Republican Party convention, Ronald Reagan made a costly political mistake. He said that if he won the nomination, he would want Senator Richard Schweiker of Pennsylvania as his running mate. Conservatives got angry. Schweiker was a liberal Republican. Some political observers say this is why Reagan lost the nomination to President Ford. Many of the delegates wanted Reagan to then be Ford's running mate, but Reagan was not interested in becoming vice president. Instead, the nominee was Senator Robert Dole of Kansas. Nonetheless, Reagan received a long and enthusiastic response from the convention delegates when Gerald Ford motioned for him to come down and join him at the podium. If I could just take a moment and tell, I had an assignment the other day. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now. We live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we met our challenge, whether they have the freedoms that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Mr. President. It was a preview of the strong and confident speaking style that would serve Reagan well four years later. Indeed, as the future president, Ronald Reagan would be known as the great communicator. The general election campaign started in September 1976. One newspaper said, the campaign left voters feeling sleepy because it was not very interesting. Ford and Carter agreed to debate each other on television. No one had done that since 1960, when Richard Nixon and John Kennedy had several televised debates. Many people thought Ford did a little better than Carter in the first debate. In the second debate, however, President Ford made a mistake. He wrongly suggested that the Soviet Union did not control Eastern Europe. I don't believe that uh, the Yugoslavians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Romanians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. Each of those countries is independent, autonomous. It has its own territorial integrity. And the United States does not concede that those countries are under the domination of the Soviet Union. Carter responded, I would like to see Mr. Ford convince the Polish Americans and the Czech Americans and the Hungarian Americans in this country that those countries don't live under the domination and supervision of the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. The third debate did not have a clear winner. Opinion polls showed that many voters were still undecided. In November, Jimmy Carter won the election. He received 51% of the popular vote. President Ford won 48%. A lot had changed in the two years since Jimmy Carter began to receive national attention. Most Americans had never heard of him before. Now, many of those same people had just elected him the 39th president of the United States. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.